Dating apps, the modern version of playing duck, duck, goose with other people's pictures. As in, you ugly, I'm a duck you. You unemployed, I'm a duck you. But you're cute. I'm a goose you, baby. But how did we get here? Well, let's take a look and find out, shall we? Join us as we delve into the history of dating apps. Before computers, TVs, or phones existed, people typically interacted solely with their local social circles. But that can make dating difficult for some people who may not see a potential mate within that social circle. This is a problem people face even today. If you spend your time playing Pokemon in the basement, you might not have a huge pool of people in your social circle waiting to date you. And sure, you might be the Grand Wizard of Dungeons & Dragons, but that damsel in distress that you saved isn't real. But just because you don't know anyone in your social circle that you'd like to date doesn't mean you don't want to find love. And this explains why there is a demand for these types of services. People want to meet people beyond their current social circles, which are often limited. Going back as far as the late 1600s, there are examples of people posting personal ads looking for love. At first, these were primarily used by the upper class because one, they were the only ones literate enough to read the ads, and two, they were often involved in arranged marriages or relationships based on convenience, and sometimes they wanted to venture beyond. Matrimony agencies, which were early forms of dating agencies, also popped up, and their job was to match people based on social status, financial stability, and moral standing. So to some degree, you could think of that like a background check of sorts, which is very much unlike modern dating apps, because nowadays, any Bill and Ted can join those apps and say whatever they want about themselves, just as long as they have a legit email. I'm a rocket scientist. Yep, sure you are, Bill. Yeah, you spelled scientist wrong on your profile. And rocket. And Bill. But we're here to talk about dating apps, right? So let's jump to the 1960s. Picture this. A group of Harvard brainiacs, probably wearing sweater vests, and maybe thick, I like warm milk glasses, thought to themselves, computers are like our nerd friends. How can we use our nerd friends to get a date? And that mentality led to the birth of Operation Match. It was like a high-tech version of Spin the Bottle. People would fill out questionnaires about their beliefs, their behaviors, and their preferences, and then the computer would match people based on their profiles. Essentially, it was love by Scantron. It was an interesting idea, but it was deeply flawed. Once, a student from Duke University was even matched with his sister, proving, once and for all, that computers are incestuous. While this gained a bit of popularity at the time, it was really just a flash in the pan. And by the late 1960s, its momentum had died down and people had lost interest. So, let's jump to the disco era, 1970s to 1980s. During this time, dating companies moved away from computers and instead started using videos. In these videos, individuals would describe their hobbies, their interests, and what they were looking for in a partner. I'm not afraid to get sand on my tuxedo if you're not afraid to let the wind mess your hair up a little bit when I take the top down. And then, other people would watch those tapes and see if they were interested. It was like going to a video store, only instead of trying to rent the most recent Batman movie, you watched videos about people telling you how attractive they are, and then you decided whether or not you actually agreed with them. I'm, I'm really looking for somebody I can feel special about, and I don't encounter people like that very often, and I'm hoping you're one of them. Now, while this was innovative for the time, it was also super awkward, because basically, it put people on the spot to sell themselves, which is not an easy thing for all people to do. If you watch some of the videos of this time, you can tell that a lot of these services were popular with men who loved sweaters and whose mustache could do the electric slide. Now, while video-based dating did pick up some steam, it always remained relatively niche and it was never the preferred way to meet people. So, let's fast forward to the mid-90s, where the internet was gaining popularity and we had the launch of Match.com. Match.com was the pioneer of online dating. And it would inspire what we know today as the hookup detector. Uh, I mean, the dating app. One of the appeals of internet-based dating is that it opens up people's opportunities beyond chance. Before, you had to hope to meet somebody in your daily life. But now, people could go online and choose whoever they wanted to meet. It was like a menu, but for people. The convenience was also appealing, since they could peruse through people's profiles while wearing their pajamas like the true perverts they are. Bonus points if you can say that five times fast. Now, of course, when one thing is successful, you're bound to have competitors emerge, and online dating platforms are no different. Thus, 
the online dating boom. As the new millennium dawned, we had a whole new wave of dating platforms, each bringing its own flavor to the mix. So some of Match.com's competitors included eHarmony, which launched in 2000. eHarmony relied on a set of questionnaires and algorithms to help people find their match. So it would try to find connections based on people's preferences. Some people like to go fishing. Some people like a sense of humor. Some people like crack. Whatever they were into, eHarmony would try to accommodate those desires. In 2003, Plenty of Fish launched as its competitor. Now, the main appeal of this platform was that it was completely free. Match.com and eHarmony were subscription-based. That means you had to pay for them. So Plenty of Fish was like the discount eHarmony. Now, the advantage to this was that it meant it had a much larger database because any Tom, Dick, or Harold could sign up for it. But the drawback was that it had a much larger database because any Tom, Dick, or Harold could sign up for it. That means that there was no exclusivity. While the paid sites obviously were looking to profit, their cost also acted as a bit of a gatekeeper because it eliminated people who might not be serious or who might not have the disposable income necessary to pay for a dating site. So because Plenty of Fish was free, that means it was open to everyone. Shark, tuna, salmon, mermaid, seaweed, all of it was welcome. But that doesn't mean everything you find is going to be what you want. In 2004, OkCupid launched. This was also a subscription model but it aimed to improve upon what eHarmony did by adding personality quizzes and using data to drive the connections. Whereas eHarmony was seen as the more serious app you could turn to to find the spouse, OkCupid was more laid back and inclusive. It relied on psychology-based questions to find a match. So in terms of dating, eHarmony was like the serious guy with the good job that wanted to settle down. OkCupid was like the guy who was a bit more youthful, a bit more fun, and marriage would be cool, but let's grab a coffee and talk about our mommy issues first. And Plenty of Fish was like the homeless guy who sits next to you at the park. Each of the platforms added new dimensions to digital dating, and they completely changed the dating scene. People went from winking at each other from across the bar to diving into each other's DM, all from the comfort of their own homes. What really boosted online dating's prominence was the popularity of the smartphone. Once phones became devices that people used all day, every day, it replaced everything else in life, and it became the place where everything happened. Socializing didn't happen in real life anymore. It happened on the phone, in every possible way. So, why not dating? Dating sites slowly evolved into dating apps, which were now like love catalogs, complete with GPS capabilities. That meant, if you were out and about on a Saturday night, in the mood for a hookup, as people tend to be then you could find one in real time. And the app that truly brought the I want love and I want it now mentality to the forefront was Grindr. Grindr was for love on the go and it catered to the LBGTQ plus community. Not only did it make meeting people around you easier, it made it easier to meet other people from the same community. This app became so popular that the heterosexual community got jealous because they wanted their own GPS based hookup finder. And this birthed Tinder in 2012. Tinder made swiping right a thing. Now, people could literally scroll through profiles the way they scroll through TikTok videos, and if they liked what they saw, they'd swipe right. Meaning, they likey. Tinder was very much based on first impressions, so appearance was important. Tinder profiles became the peacock feathers of the digital age. Show your best photos if you want any shot at a match. Now, if both people swiped right on each other's profile, a connection was made, And then they could begin talking to each other if they wanted to. It was like saying, hey, do you find this man cute enough to say words to? Yeah, okay. Do you find this woman attractive enough to buy overpriced coffee for? Yeah, okay, I'll do that. Great. Then I pronounce you guys chat buddies. You may message the other. The mid-2010s was a renaissance period for digital romance. By now, everybody's thumbs were in tip-top shape, ripped and muscular from all the swiping. But eventually, the dating apps went nuts and started appealing to every niche you could possibly imagine. Have you ever wanted to find love in a corn maze? If so, Farmers Only allowed you to find a love connection within the farming community. Yep, that's right. You could connect with a farmer. Make your own pitchfork joke there. Have you ever had a thing for that sexy beast Captain Hook? Then you might want love from a sea captain. So go check out Sea Captain Date, where people who love water get together. And who knows, maybe you'll look for a sea captain, but you'll find yourself a sexy mermaid. Have you ever said to yourself, morals are for losers? If so, Ashley Madison may appeal to you. This is designed for married people who just want to have an affair. Do you love rug burns on your face? If so, check out Bristler. 
A dating app for people with beards. What's the difference between gluten and Satan? Absolutely nothing, right? Great, we agree. We can chat about it on Gluten-Free Singles, which connects individuals that live a gluten-free lifestyle, making it easier to find a partner who shares your hatred of bread. If you're okay with bread, but hate electricity, check out Amish Dating. If you want a super spicy date, literally, as in you want to roll around in Tabasco with somebody, check out Hot Sauce Passions. And if you're into clowns, if you like seltzer sprayed in your face, or if you've always wanted to have a big family and fit them all into a matchbox car, check out Clown Dating. Point is, there are literally dating apps for almost every niche you can think of. And just when you thought you'd seen it all, Hinge jumped onto the scene, which sought to combine the original concepts of dating with the newfound dating attitudes. It leaned back into the concept of finding a serious relationship but kept some of the casual elements of modern dating, such as swiping when you saw any potential red flags. This returned to the more serious relationship vibe, away from the casual hookup vibe that Tinder was associated with. Building upon another niche that felt underserved, Bumble came buzzing around in 2014. Now, unlike the other apps, Bumble focused specifically on female empowerment. Bumble is unique in that it allows only women to initiate the conversation. This feature was designed to reduce unsolicited messages from men who kept giving women the creeps. With Bumble, the girls would be in more control. They'd have the ability to find their honey, but they'd also be able to sting any guys that they felt weren't giving off the right buzz. Okay, okay, I know. I know. I'm sorry. I'll stop. I'll behive myself. Oh my god, what's wrong with me? My behavior is appalling. Oh, this is embarrassing. Why did they have to call it Bumble? It was so popular that it led to Bumble BFF for finding friends and Bumble Biz for professional networking. Bumble's women-first messaging feature and its emphasis on respectful interactions make it distinct in the dating app scene. As of 2023, Bumble has 58 million active users and it is Tinder's biggest rival. The COVID-19 pandemic boosted the popularity of dating apps during a time when people suffered from isolation. Many people used them as social lines just to prevent loneliness. And to cater to this, many of the apps created advanced features such as video call and virtual dates. But it's not all sunshine and rainbows. Dating apps have been criticized for their impact on the culture. For one, their emphasis on looks can be seen as shallow and disadvantageous for people who may not consider their physical looks to be their best traits. It has also created a paradox of choice for some people. In other words, people may feel like they have so many options that they're missing out on picking one over the others. And they may always question the relationships that they're in. Because as good as it may be, they may convince themselves that they're always one swipe away from something even better. There have also been concerns about these apps handling personal data. As each member openly releases private information about themselves, which is stored in the company's database. But so many databases get hacked nowadays, it's easy to imagine people getting their personal information stolen at some point. Now, there's no telling how dating and technology will mingle in the future. Perhaps it'll include virtual reality. Perhaps it'll be using more advanced AI. Or maybe humans will just start dating robots because why not? Or maybe, just maybe, we'll make a nostalgic return to the way things used to be, where people look for a special encounter with each other by chance in real life and leave the apps at home. Who knows for sure? Well, AI probably knows for sure. AI seems to know everything nowadays. <laughs> AI. Wouldn't know it all.